Hi everyone and thank you for having me. Um, I'm sorry I have to continue in English. I'm very poor with my Spanish and it's been some years so I think it's better for your safety of being able to understand my presentation that I have it in English. Um, I thought today about giving a presentation a little bit about what I'm working on currently in my lab and some of the recent work that we've done on um, crop pollination that Nacho was also involved with. So a little bit of background, I don't know how much you've read on the literature in terms of crop pollination, but depending on the source that you look at, um, people say that every one in three mouths that we eat are pollinated by animals, um, or if you look at um, the um, Alexandra Klein paper from 2007, it's about um, over three quarters of the world's food crops benefit from pollination by animals. I'd like to talk a little bit more about um, the taxa that benefit in particular from um, crop or that, ben that contribute to crop pollination, that it's not just bees and that there's also um, other taxa of flies and beetles that contribute. Then I thought I'd get a little bit more into what my lab is doing at the moment. Um, so I've got some PhD and master students that are working on various projects um, related to pollinator plant and landscape factors that affect, fit, affect fitness of both the plant and the pollinator. And I'm also working on some methods and tools to understand plant pollinator interactions. And this is why I'm here um, for these couple of weeks. I got an OECD fellowship um, to come and work in Europe. Um, so I'm going to be doing some work at Reading on apple pollination as well as the work I'm collaborating on here with Nacho. So as I said, there's a whole group of crops that are pollinator dependent and they're um, increasing in terms of the area that they're grown um, across the world. These are crops that make our food, um, our diet really interesting. So of course, things like your rice and your corn um, are your staples that have nothing to do with, or very little to do with pollination. Um, but the really um, yummy and interesting crops that we like, like fruit and vegetables that give us that diversity and fibre in our diets, are these ones that actually benefit from pollination. So apart from being really tasty and good for your diets, these pollinator dependent crops are also um, good for you in terms of the vitamin C that they provide, the lycopene, <coughs> antioxidants, lipids, vitamin A, all sorts of things, folic acid, um, that are also important to our diets. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about the taxa that are involved in crop pollination. Most people, when you talk about <coughs> crop pollination, assume that um, Apis mellifera or the European honeybee is the dominant taxon. And yes, they are really ubiquitous and really efficient pollinators for a whole range of crops, but they're not the only pollinators. And I think in the past, this has been a little bit of a misconception that um, a lot of researchers have focused on without looking at potential other taxa that might be around. This was a seminal paper in 2013 by Lucas Garibaldi um, that <coughs> showed that wild pollinators um, basically enhance fruit set irrespective of honeybee abundance. And the first interesting thing I found um, that came out of this paper was that fruit set increased by wild bees in 100% of the crops, whereas by honeybees it only was 14% of crops. And an increase in wild bee visitation enhanced the fruit set by twice as much as that of honeybees. So there was thinking in this field that wild pollinators may be contributing something more than we thought initially. So this spurred me to go on um, from my experience, from my PhD and the work that I was doing to just try and quantify to what extent these pollinators other than um, bees, other than the honeybee as well as other than bees might be doing for our crops. This resulted in a paper that was published early this year um, that Nacho and I wrote that looked at um, 
insects other than bees and how much they contribute to pollination. So I'd like to go through a little bit about the results of that, which I think are pretty interesting, and then I'll go into a little bit more about um, the work we're doing in our lab at the moment. So why look at non-bees? I think it was obvious after doing this study the reason why. Um, of all the researchers and studies that I looked at and approached to find out, to try and quantify more about non-bee crop pollination, over a third of them um, basically didn't even record non-bees. So this is not that they did their surveys and then had a zero for non-bees. They actually said that they saw a few but they didn't think that they were important enough to record. Um, the knowledge gaps that we still uh, don't know about and really um, the literature is really lacking is exactly which pollinators match which crop. So this is something I tried to address in this paper but there's a whole lot more in this field. Particularly in Australia, um, we have huge variation in <coughs> climates as well as microclimates. We've got crops grown from the far um, southeast right up across the top. We've got climate zones that span cool temperate in the south right up to the tropics in the north. And there's some crops like avocado and mango that are grown all the way along that east coast which can be three and a half thousand kilometres. And we've got um, different soil types and all sorts of stuff. And we have really basic knowledge about who's visiting what in different crops, um, let alone within the same crop. So this is something I'm still pursuing at the moment. Another reason to look at non-bees, apart from just bees, is they've got really cool diets. Um, so not just pollen and nectar provisioning like bees have to, um, to reproduce. These guys, um, for example, some um, flies have a, a larval life stage where they eat dead animals or um, dung, um, flowers, aphids, all sorts of things in a larval stage. They also have really diverse nesting needs. So in Australia we've got both um, solitary bees that make nests like this and we've got social bees like this that are kind of ubiquitous around houses in the tropics in crevices and sheds, whatever. There's a few species that can do that. Um, our blowflies, of which we've got heaps of species, like to um, eat kangaroo carcasses and roadkill and we've got mango farmers that have understood this and taken them into their orchards um, so that they can increase fly pollination of their mangoes. And even on dairy farms we've got um, sort of holding ponds of sewage and water where drone fly larvae like to breed. So there's a whole lot of interesting stuff there um, in terms of trying to manage for increased pollination which we're far away from but just trying to understand what these guys need to have them around farms is really interesting to me. Um, another reason is we don't know the extent about their complementary resource use. We have really diverse assemblages in Australia. Um, we don't even know some of the bee species. There's over two and a half thousand species that we know of um, and a lot of them are still undescribed which sounds ridiculous but it's true let alone the flies. There's very few fly taxonomists um, in Australia and even then we're restricted to particular families that we can work on, otherwise I've got to send them overseas. So in terms of comp complementary resource use, I can see examples of this in my everyday field work where we've got um, pollinators that come out really early in the morning, some that come out late in the afternoon. Um, we've got differences in flower structure. There's a few papers that have shown in strawberry that pollinators, some pollinate the top flowers, others go to the bottom and raspberry. There's a few examples in other systems but we have um, on top of the geographic diversity that we've got in climatic zones, there's obviously differences in cultivars, there's differences in tree sizes. All of this stuff is something that we don't know. And something that we've been working on is differences in the, the type of weather that we've got on the probability of pollination. So particularly in the tropics where we do some work on mango and avocado pollination, we've got different taxa that come out on sunny days to those that can come out on rainy days. Um, and 
the rainy days are definitely dominated by fly and beetle taxa as opposed to bee taxa. So there's really interesting stuff there that deserves further attention. So the crops that we looked at in this non-bee paper um, that I showed you earlier are a whole range of crops spanning from mangoes to kiwis to apples, um, canola, sunflowers, avocado um, and custard apples. We looked at the contribution by non-bees by using five different metrics. We had visitation, um, single visit effectiveness where we looked at one visit by each taxa and then worked out how much pollen was deposited. What we called total effectiveness which is a, a function of both the visits as well as the pollen deposition. We looked at fruit set or seed set and then how they responded to remnant vegetation. So we did this, the flower visitation is basically walking along a transect within an orchard um, during peak flowering and having how many, um, measuring how many flowers are visited. <coughs> this is um, all the data from all the crops synthesised into one figure where we have um, basically all the different types of crops along the x-axis and the percentage of visits on the y and you can see that the blue is the bees and then over here we've got the non-bees. So just scanning across here you can see that there's, it's really diverse even for the same crops in different systems, the diversity was huge. Um, one particularly interesting thing was um, the non-bee flower visits um, in canola across all these countries and we had variation from 5 to 80% of non-bees making up those assemblages. Um, and in terms of mango, we had um, in this paper only three mango systems. Sorry for the bar charts, Nacho. But we just had, I, this is more just to eyeball the data, there's no quantitative stuff here that I want you to see other than just look at the differences um, in terms of the tax that we had, um, differences in diptera in particular. Um, and it's just, that's just the same crop grown in three different regions and that's only one example. So as you can see we saw that there's differences in the percent visits by honeybees, other bees and non-bees which are the three um, I guess groups that we pooled to do these results. Um, to work out per visit effectiveness we did this for a subset of dominant species and then from individual studies, standardised, it was standardised by z-scores before analysis. So the per-visit analysis is, is basically a bagged virgin flower um, that's then opened and you get one visit by a particular taxon. What we found here um, was that non-bees were on average less effective on this per-visit basis. Um, they didn't differ to the honeybees, um, but definitely less and the other bees were um, higher. When we combined this as a function of visits, we found that um, non-bees performed better in this instance because they're quite frequent visitors. So there was no difference between the three taxa when you look at it as a function of visits plus pollen deposition. In terms of their contribution to fruit set, there was higher visitation by other bees and non-bees, um, enhanced fruit set more so than similar increases in visitation by the honeybee, which is similar to the Garibaldi paper. And in terms of responses to remnant vegetation, um, the other bees declined sharply with increasing isolation from this remnant vegetation. And I've got a question there about implications for management because we, at least in Australia, we've tried to go on the trend to um, preserving remnant vegetation on orchards so that we can keep the bees happy, um, <coughs> which is always a good thing but we don't really understand yet what the non-bees need and they're contributing quite a lot to some of the other crops. So there's a few um, companies that, that are now getting into breeding things like blowflies um, and other taxa that are helping them with um, seed crop pollination in Tasmania as well as the uh, mango stuff I told you about that some of the farmers are doing up north. So it's just some food for thought about what we might need to do to think about these really diverse life histories that we may want to preserve because it's not necessarily only remnant vegetation. So 
the next thing that I just wanted to talk a bit more about is that now that we know a little bit more about um, the pollination of particular crops, I'm interested in going a little bit further and understanding more about um, the fitness of the plant, so food quality, um, fruit quality, as well as impacts on the reproduction of the particular taxa that we're looking at that visit these crops. So what I'm working on with this OECD fellowship is the extent to which um, foreign pollen or heteropacific pollen transfer affects plant and pollinator fitness. Um, and also moving that from a field scale up to a bigger scale, um, understanding the delivery of pollination ecosystem services at the catchment scale. So these are really early day projects that are um, of interest to me that I don't have any data for, but I'm working on at the moment. So what factors affect crop pollination success beyond these visits? We know that um, pollinators gain benefits from plants. They need nectar um, for energy, for food storage, and they need pollen for, that they get their protein from for reproduction. We know that pollen foraging is mediated by the amount of pollen stored in a colony and brood size in honeybees. And we know that these factors are all regulated by the landscape context where the pollinators are, as well as the environment and the conditions within the environment. So this is something that I'd like to talk about a little bit further. So we've got a whole lot of different land uses, including urban areas, including mosaic landscapes, as well as these different types of vegetation within remnant forest systems. So how will this affect the fitness of the crop plants that we've got, as well as the population dynamics of the pollinators? There's a few papers out there um, that are working on this. This one's looking at um, honeybee colonies in different landscapes, and they found that the, lands, the, the honeybee colonies within um, urban areas were more productive than those in agricultural areas. There's another one here that looked more on pollen quality and pollen diversity, which is something that I'm particularly interested in. <coughs> this is only for honeybees, mind you. Um, and they found that pollen quality helps with tolerance to parasites, um, but that high protein pollen was similar to having a diversity of pollen. These Things again are all regulated by the environment, so our observations that we've only got a little bit of data for on differences between assemblages with the weather, basically, are all going to affect these fitness dynamics. The second part of the equation is the plant requirements from pollinators. So the plants need the pollinators to make enough visits to transfer um, a special or an amount of or quantity of pollen that will enable the pollen tubes to grow and for them to actually um, make fruits. But then there's another issue about the quality of pollen. And <coughs> this is quite widespread in natural systems that people have looked at this and with particular taxa like honeybees. But the question in total about how this might affect a crop system is less well known, particularly with the taxa that are not the focal points like honeybees. So Garrett in 2014 um, did look at the fruit set with different taxa after a number of different visits. So they looked at one visit, four visits, one visit, two visits and four visits to a given flower. So rather than just looking at one visit and seeing how that affects fruit set, some particular crops require more than one visit. And they showed that, um, yeah, for some taxa it does differ with the number of visits and it can differ among taxa. This business of um, whether it's the quantity or the quality of pollen transfer is really important in terms of um, the benefits that plant, plants and pollinators are getting for each other, which has implications for networks in particular regions. So if in, we've got an avocado crop in one field and next door we've got canola that's blooming at the same time, we could potentially expect facilitation if we're getting pollinated communities from next door, or it could be a bad thing if it's transferring foreign pollen or heterospecific pollen and then that influences the plant's reproduction. So this trade-off between both of those things we don't really know a hell of a lot about. There's a little bit in the plant ecology literature um, with 
um, looking at um, hand pollination experiments about how particular diversities and amounts of different pollen quantity and quality can affect reproduction of plants. But there's nothing that's looked at that whole sequence from the beginning of a, a given system where a pollinator has to come in and there's all those metrics that a pollinator can affect. And then it goes to the point where the pollen tubes grow. And then from then on, we've got post pollination processes that the plant is regulating itself, like resource assimilation, particularly in tree crops. There's all of that stuff going on that could potentially mean the pollen is good or the pollen is bad from what they've got. And I think this is some space that I'm trying to understand a bit more about. Um, so I mentioned fruit quality as being something really important that's kind of um, little recognised in the literature. This is one of the papers that acknowledged um, different types of pollination might be important for um, particular industry characteristics that are important. In this case, shelf life and commercial value of, um, I think it was raspberry or strawberry, I can't remember. Um, but they basically found benefits to having bee pollination as opposed to wind pollination or self-pollination. And this, again, differed among cultivars. So another problem that we have is, is understanding these differences in quality as well as quantity for all the different varieties that we've got in crops. So it's not as easy as saying we know what canola does because brassica is grown in a whole lot of different um, cultivars or varieties. And even within a particular cultivar, there's crosses that people are making that they call something else. So just understanding this space um, is basically expanding in, in my research is trying to quantify what's happening before the visit, what's happening after the visit, how that um, visit is impacted by a whole lot of things. So rather than just having you know, the pollinator visits, you get a fruit full stop. There's all these complex interplay of factors that are potentially working to get to that final point. So the last thing I want to talk about is the current methods and tools that are available to study some of these more cooler things um, that I'm trying to understand. This is one paper that um, has tried to move this area forward in terms of using um, plant pollinator networks to try and understand dynamics in visitation and pollen deposition and how it might affect plants. But again, um, what they've done is rather than just using visitation in their plant pollinator networks, they tried to add this efficiency measure, the pollen deposition measure that I talked about. What I'm trying to do for my OECD fellowship at the moment is improve again on what this study did. So it's quite limited <coughs> in terms of the number of sites that they used and the questions that they're asking. So I'd like to expand on this with an Apple project that we're doing at the moment, just to better understand the methods of, in that complex interplay that I showed you with all the factors that are going on, there's actually better ways than just adding efficiency to visitation. So basically what they did is combine the visits with their single visit pollen transfer to get this measure of pollinator performance. So the methods available to potentially learn more about the diversity of pollen that's on the insects and the foraging behaviour and how this impacts fitness um, are techniques known as metabarcoding, which is a range of different methods that are used um, to analyse the pollen on the insects um, to better understand which whether the diversity or the quality of the pollen is affecting plant reproductive success. And this is basically another method to improve on people looking at pollen from a light microscope where you traditionally grab a pollinator, put it on some fusion gel and then use a light microscope to look at counting pollen grains. This one will um, basically cut all those corners to come back with a list of the plants that the pollinators have visited. And this is now gaining traction as a technique to use um, to potentially understand those fitness dynamics in, at the landscape level because of its ease of sampling. So my plan is to basically take it one step further to take the visitation as well as understanding the pollen transport um, and efficiency measures 
to get to the point where we understand how the landscape is affecting both pollinator and plant reproduction. So this goes on to um, what I normally do is work at the field scale and um, I've worked a little bit on the land use scale. I'll just check my, okay, I've still got time. <laughs> um, and this is one paper that's come out that's trying to say we basically need to understand more about ecosystem service provision of which pollination is one of those ecosystem services. And one way to do this is to use um, plant animal networks. But it's, this paper basically gives a summary of the literature. Um, it doesn't necessarily show a method or a way forward to um, understand how this might happen on a landscape scale and how we can make networks more spatially explicit. So I'm trying to go from having my field data and having my land use data to going up to this bigger catchment scale to understand these <coughs> trends at the landscape scale so we can understand more about what's going on in terms of community dynamics rather than just individuals. And this is another example of another paper that uses um, basically models but very little empirical or no empirical data. So it's, it's a real knowledge gap that I think needs to be addressed. So this is your typical network um, of plants in, on one um, axis and your pollinators on another. If we have a particular landscape with a whole lot of different land uses, <coughs> we could potentially be looking at networks in particular land use types and particular land uses um, rather than collapsing them down to one level, we could be looking them at, at particular nodes within that landscape. So that's something that I'm working on with Nacho um, while I'm here. So as I said, there's stuff that's in the pipeline, but um, we still haven't got to the point of analysis yet to show you any more cool results, but we're looking at heterospecific pollen transfer using Apple as a model system, and that's what I'm going to the UK for next week after here to look more at that. I've got a honours student who's looking at pollen in different land use contexts. <coughs> We're looking at tree condition and pollination and fruit set in avocado and mango. This is where we've got um, remote sensing data to look at tree health within orchards, and we can visualise this with heat maps um, and then basically see whether that's related to pollination success um, within the orchards, as well as understanding more about the quality of the yield within those orchards. And I have a PhD student that's just starting to look at dispersal distances of pollinators in crops. So traditionally, we've been using things like dyes and for the bigger taxa, radio trackers and um, LIDAR and all sorts of other mechanical methods, I guess, but now with um, molecular methods, there's a whole new field that's opened up to try and understand dispersal distances of pollinators as well as their relationship with the landscape. And the last thing that we're doing is working on plant and parasitoid networks and how they relate to each other in different land use types. That's it. Thank you. If you have any other questions, please put your hand up and ask me, but these are the people or the organisations that have sponsored my research to date. Thank you.